This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Balian, uh, who received his uh, doctorate in classical archaeology from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, and he is curator at the National Numismatic Collection at the Nederland, the Nederland, can't speak, the Nederlandische Bank uh, in the Netherlands since 2014. And he's also a lecturer at Leiden University. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Um, thank you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today, which is a great honor. And I will do my best to ensure that you will uh, not regret inviting me to speak. Today, um, I will talk about a spectacular cold hoard that was buried in the 5th century AD and found in what is now the village of Felp in the Netherlands in 1715. So that's quite a long time ago. And you see here uh, a map of the Roman Empire uh, in the early 5th century, uh, in the eastern and the western part. And Felp is just right uh, in the northwestern corner of the empire, just outside the official border, the Limes. This is the red line is uh, denoting also uh, the river Rhine. The horde, which saw the day of light in 1715, consisted of at least five late Roman gold medallions, two of which can be seen on this slide. They belong uh, to the Dutch National Numismatic Collection. Um, and on top of that, there was gold jewelry and a very large number of uh, gold coins. And the key question I will try to answer today is how did all this gold end up in Felp and why was it buried there? So what are we going to do? Um, to try to answer the key question, we will follow several lines of inquiry. First, we will look at how the hoard was discovered and what exactly was found. And next, we will look at when the gold was buried and who might have done it, who was the owner of all that uh, precious metal. And thirdly, we will look for similar finds. And finally, we will try and find out where the gold came from and how it may have been used. I will speculate at times, but with some circumstantial evidence from similar finds from the same period, I think it will be possible to paint a picture of the hoard, its context and the circumstances in which it was buried. But let's start at the beginning. Um, I will first tell you how the hoard was discovered, what was found and what happened to the finds after the discovery in Felp in 1715. Because in that year, a tobacco merchant decided to dig his barren land in the hope of improving its fertility. And he hired 10 laborers to do the job. And one of the workers hit something hard while digging. And thinking he had hit a stone, he vigorously plunged the shovel back into the ground to remove the obstacle. But instead of a stone, he noticed a gold coin. And excited, he started digging and found many more. And his seemingly inexplicable work ethic and enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm did not go unnoticed. And the other workers rushed in. And after some discussion, they decided to, to, to return in the evening to continue their search undisturbed and share what was, uh, what was found. No sooner said than done, after nightfall, they continued digging under the cover of darkness and discovered gold necklaces, bracelets, medallions, and a large number of Roman gold coins. According to contemporary accounts, the coins stood upright and were so close together that they were described as a golden pavement. The bullion value of the gold unearthed that night was estimated in 1715, as in the 18th century, at 10 to 12,000 guilders, an enormous amount. And like today, the price of gold fluctuated in the 18th century and it's difficult to get accurate figures, but we can use the estimate of the value of the hoard in 1715 to make a rough estimate of the amount of gold found at that time. And that gives us a total weight of between seven and nine kilograms. And this makes the Fell Hoard one of the largest gold hoard from the fifth century ever discovered. And to put things a little bit in perspective, a workman's wage in 1715 in the Netherlands was about one kilder a day. So the find was worth between 10 and 12,000 daily wages. 
and assuming a six day working week, this equates to around 32 to 38 annual wages. So quite a hefty sum. We owe our knowledge of this hoard and its discovery mainly to the antiquarian and coin collector Gisbert Cooper. And he wrote several letters about this spectacular find to his scholarly friends at home and abroad. And shortly after the discovery of the hoard, Gisbert Cooper spoke to local dignitaries who had managed to get their hands on some of the precious objects. Cooper's main source of information is the Baron von Spahn, the Baron von Spahn, whose estate, a castle in Felp, is only a stone throws from where the hoard was found. And the Baron had received an eyewitness account from one of the workmen who was present when the hoard was discovered. This is the Baron with his castle. And it turns out that most of the jewelry and coins were immediately sold to coltsmiths who melted them down. And Cooper only sold about 30 coins, of which he bought two. Four other coins are depicted on a sheet from the so-called Kannegieter papers um, that are named after the historian and classicist Henrik Kannegieter. Um, Kannegieter lived in the city of Arnhem in 1715, not far from where the hoard was found, and he would, uh, would probably have seen some of the coins and medallions from the hoard with his own eyes. At least he made drawings of them. On the left of this slide is a sheet, this is this sheet, um, showing the obverse and reverse of two of the medallions and four of the coins from the hoard. On the right, you can see detail with the red border around it, but here the obverse and reverse of four of the solidi, the cold Rome, late Roman cold coins, and here a medallion of uh, Galla Placidia, which, according to uh, uh, a note on this paper, belonged to the Baron von Spahn, whom we, just, whom we have just met. Um, the detail below this medallion is one a medallion of uh, the Emperor Honorius, uh, eventually ended up in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, but this medallion was stolen in 1831, along with many other gold objects, and that were never recovered. So all that remains of this stolen Honorius medallion is this beautiful drawing by Kanegieter. Exactly how many medallions were found in 1715 is not entirely clear. Cooper never mentioned a number and only uh, wrote that he himself had seen three. So, recapping. There were at least five medallions. Four are still in museum collections, two in the collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and two in the Dutch National Numismatic Collection in Amsterdam. Plus, we have the one that was stolen in the 19th century from Paris, thus making a total of five uh, of those large medallions. I've now briefly told you how the gold was discovered, what was found and what happened to most of the finds. And we can now ask ourselves how the gold jewelry, medallions and coins ended up in felt and who owned them. The answer to these questions, uh, uh, to answer these questions, we first need to find out when the hoard was buried. Um, as far as we know, the most recent objects to survive from the finds uh, are the two late Roman medallions of the Empress Galla Placidia, uh, depicted one here on this slide. And these were made between 426 and 430 AD. The most recent gold coins mentioned by Gisbert Cooper in his letters are also coins of Galla Placidia, and all her solidity was struck between 422 and 435 AD. As there are no detailed descriptions of these coins, we cannot date them more precisely, unfortunately. So all we can say is that the gold must have been buried in or after 426 AD, which is the earliest possible date of the two Galapakidia medallions that survive to this day. So what was Europe and the Roman Empire like in the early 5th century AD? At that time, the Roman Empire was plagued by internal strife and external attacks by Germanic tribes. The empire was divided into a western and an eastern part with two emperors. The eastern emperor resided in Constantinople, present day in Istanbul, uh, here on the Bosporus. And in the west, 
the um, emperors divided at the time between Rome, uh, but mainly stayed in Ravenna, which was a relatively safe place to be because it was surrounded by marshes. In the early fifth century, the area around Felp, just north of the Roman border, was inhabited by Franks of Germanic descent. Franks entered the historical record in the third century AD, and they were not unified people, but a loose federation, a confederation of individual tribes. And some scholars refer to them as a tribal swarm because they only seem to unite in offensive or defensive campaigns. And when they did join forces, however, these tribes were collectively known as Franks. Throughout the third century and the first half of the fourth century AD, the Franks caused the Romans a great deal of trouble by repeatedly raiding the Roman Empire. However, the Romans always managed to push them back beyond their borders. In the fourth century, Roman foreign policy changed and groups of Franks were allowed to settle within the borders of the Roman Empire in exchange for military service. And the result is that by 360 AD, the eastern part of the Dutch river area and the area south of it was inhabited by allied Franks. You see your map of, uh, well, the, the northwestern corner of the Roman Empire in the fifth century with the Netherlands right here and below the Limes, the red uh, Limes line is the river Rhine flowing with Felp here pretty much in the center. And the red area denotes the area where the Franks lived, just north and south of the river Rhine. Once enemies of Rome, the Franks now reinforced the Roman army with their own troops and defended the empire's frontier against barbarian incursions. In the early 5th century, the Rhine frontier was abandoned by the Romans and the present-day Netherlands was no longer part of the Roman Empire. In 406 AD, a few years after the Roman army had left the Rhine frontier, hordes of Vandals, Suevi and Alans crossed the Rhine, sweeping across coal, plundering the countryside, sacking and destroying many towns and leaving a devastation of which we have shocking accounts. And after this barbarian incursion, a series of Roman civil wars further disrupted the Western Roman Empire. And these events will certainly have caused great uncertainty and unrest, but the invasion of 406 AD itself probably had little direct effect on the inhabitants, inhabitants of the Dutch river area, that's the, the red area, as the major devastation took place mainly in the area to the south. Peace was eventually restored. And in 418 AD, new administrative measures were taken by the Roman government. And these measures only affected the south of Gaul, the southern part of modern France, shown once again that the north was left to its own devices, meaning that the population there was largely left to fend for itself and could no longer expect Roman support. Thus, in the first half of the 5th century AD, the time where the cult was buried, Felp was located in Frankish territory and the Germanic Roman inhabitants of the area lived there in relative peace and without direct interference from the Roman government. It is now time to return to the uh, hoard, the cold hoard found at Felp in 1715. Um, the Felp hoard is part of a group of similar finds from the first half of the first uh, of the fifth century AD, all consisting of cold jewelry, uh, sometimes accompanied by Roman cold coins, Roman sobidi, the standard Roman cold coin, the late Roman cold coin. And one of these finds was made in 1851 in Felp, about a 10 minutes walk, less than a kilometer from where the 1715 hoard was found. The 1851 find consisted of two Roman uh, finger rings, two pieces of gold ingot and eight necklaces. And some of the necklaces found in 1851 are shown here on an 1887 lithograph, also showing the two Roman rings here to the left and the right, and two small wire-shaped cold bars, which are depicted here. And 
Yeah, uh, on the bottom uh, so, uh, side of the, the slide, you can see a more modern photograph um, of the, uh, 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 the necklaces that are now in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow after they uh, ended up in Germany uh, in the 19th century, they were sold off. And in 1945, they were taken by the Russians to Moscow. The type of necklace shown here on the slide with stamped triangles and dots, uh, the stamped triangles and dots are here on the, uh, the, the larger part of the necklaces, um, is now known today as the felt type after the pieces discovered there, uh, there in 1851. And this slide shows several examples of the felt type jewelry that is only found in the eastern and northeastern part of the Netherlands and the westernmost part of Germany, the area that was once inhabited by the Franks. It is thought that all the jewelry of the felt type comes from the same workshop somewhere in the lower Rhine area and that they were all made in a relatively short period uh, between about 425 and 450 AD. This Germanic jewelry was probably made from gold obtained by melting uh, Roman gold coins, the solidi, and this is thought because the gold fineness of the necklace and the late Roman solidi is uh, the, the fineness of the necklaces and the Roman solidi is exactly the same. And all these clearly places the felt type jewelry and related finds, such as the Roman rings, the medallions, and gold coins, in a Germanic context as they do not occur within the Roman Empire. The red oval on this map shows where most jewelry of the felt type was found. And the letters of Gisbert Cooper show that gold necklaces were also found in felt in 1750. And it is impossible to say whether these were of the felt type as there is no good description, but it could well be the case. To summarize, the fell port was deposited in 426 AD or slightly later and probably belonged to a Frank as the area of present day Felp was part of Frankish territory. The neck rings from the 1715 fell port may have been of the Felp type as they are found in other hordes from the same period and from the same region, but unfortunately we have no way of proving this. This brings us today to our final topic. And that is the function and origin of the gold found at Felp. What was the Roman and Germanic gold used for? Where did it come from and how and why did it end up in Felp in the Netherlands? It is, I think, reasonable to assume that only the Frankish elite had access to such valuables. And so the gold would have belonged to people in the higher circles, such as kings uh, or chieftains or and to people in their immediate surroundings. Giving gold to others allowed these high-ranking individuals to attract followers and maintain their prestige and power. But how did the Frankish elite get their hands on this gold? As you have heard, Germanic tribes often raided the Roman Empire and the gold could have been plunder. However, given the Franks given that the Franks were allowed, uh, allied uh, to the Romans and, as far as we know, leave, uh, lived peacefully in the northern border or um, at the northern border of the Roman Empire. I think another scenario is more likely and that the Roman court traveled to the Franks with Roman approval. It is known from Roman sources that large amounts of gold also traveled outside the borders of the Roman Empire as payment for military service as Germanic soldiers were often recruited by the Roman army. A horde from the village of Renen in the Dutch uh, river area, about three kilometers from Felp, could point to such a connection, as it may have belonged to a Germanic soldier who served in the Roman army. In Renen, two necklaces of the Felp type are found, as well as a fragment of a late Roman uh, piece of jewelry, that's the object here at the bottom left, with the two felt necklaces uh, above that. These Roman neck rings um, here denoted in red, uh, uh, or torques as they were called, were used as special insignia for elite units of the Roman army, uh, such as the emperor's bodyguard pictured here 
on uh, a late Roman silver platter uh, depicting uh, the Emperor Constantius II with here the detail of the bodyguard wearing his torque. It is known from Roman sources that members of the imperial bodyguard were recruited from barbarian tribes in late Roman times. So the cold necklace, uh, the cold neck rings from Renan, uh, from the Renan horde may therefore have belonged to a Frankish warrior who has served in the Roman army. After returning to his homeland, the Roman piece of jewelry together with two Germanic neck rings of the Palp type would have been buried in the present day Renan in the Netherlands. Such Roman neck rings are also depicted on Roman cult medallions. Such as this uh, beautiful nine solidus cult medallion of the Emperor Constantius II from the collection of the coin cabinet in Berlin. The obverse shows the Emperor holding a globe in his left hand, crowned by the figure of victory. And the reverse shows Constantius again. Uh, but this time in a chariot drawn by no less than six horses. But it is the objects under the chariot that interest us now, as they show a series of neck rings depicted here, among other symbols of wealth and victory, like wreaths here, uh, laurel leaves to the left and to the right, a barrel or bags of coins that are flowing out of the, the barrel or the bag, and two fibulae uh, that are cloak pins, uh, no doubt made of precious metal. This is a um, medallion struck in Antioch, so here are the letters A and N as the abbreviation of the mint. Such jewelry could have formed part of gifts from Roman emperors to, for example, Germanic and other soldiers. And the jewelry and Roman cult medallions, like this one pictured here and the ones found at Fel, could form part of imperial gifts. And in this way, such items could become into the possession of Germanic soldiers and eventually end up outside the Roman Empire. Apart from payments to soldiers, there are other ways in which Roman valuables could have found their way to tribes outside the Roman Empire. The Roman jewelry from Renan could also have been looted during a Germanic raid into Roman territory, or it could have been used as a ransom for a Roman who had fallen into Germanic hands during a raid or a battle. This might ring true for other holds, but as mentioned before, I think this is not the origin of the cult in Felp because the Franks were Roman allies. Another plausible scenario is that the cult found at Felt was part of a gift from the Roman authorities to the Frankish elite as the Romans used gold in their foreign policy. Gold and other precious commodities were widely used as diplomatic gifts to barbarian tribes. Uh, gold was paid to prevent barbarians from invading uh, Roman territory or to induce them to attack other tribes that were considered a threat to Roman security. Roman sources record huge amounts of gold sometimes given to barbarian tribes and foreign powers in this way. Annual payments of 100 to 700 kilograms of gold or 1600 kilograms in one go were not uncommon according to these sources. The gold could be paid for in coins, medallions, jewelry or tableware. It was these military and political payments that ensured the great wealth of the Franks who lived on the right bank of the Rhine, just outside the Roman Empire. And it is in these areas that we find the hordes of Roman gold coins and the jewelry of the Felp type, probably made from melted Roman gold coins. Alas, no settlements, sanctuaries or cemeteries have yet been found in the area where the two Felp hordes were discovered. However, the two remarkable hordes from 1715 and the one from 1851 indicate that there was once a Frankish power center of some importance in or near Fel in the 5th century AD. So we now have a possible scenario with a Frankish king or chieftain who had amassed a large amount of gold. According to the letters written by Gisbert Cooper, the late Roman gold coins found in Fel in 1715 cover a considerable period. The oldest coins he mentions are those of the sons of Constantine the Great, 
and he also mentions later emperors. And this series of emperors and empresses cover at least about a century from 325 to 425 AD. From the third quarter of the fourth century AD, the Roman solidity in circulation were regularly and relatively quickly replaced by newly minted coins. This means that the likelihood, likelihood of seeing coins of all the emperors mentioned by Cooper circulating in the Roman Empire in the first quarter of the fifth century is very small. And it's therefore unlikely that the solidity from the fell port originally formed one single coherent batch of coins. And the old coins show that the coins in the foul port were probably collected over the course of half a century or even more. So, there are other hordes that have a similar composition, like the hoard uh, from Dortmund in present day Germany, which, like Felp, was outside the borders of the Roman Empire. The Dortmund hoard was discovered in 1907 and consists of 444 solidi and three neck rings of the Felp type as well as several Germanic imitations of Roman silver coins. The Dortmund coins, like those from Felp, cover a long period, in this case, some 55 to 75 years, as you can see in the graph. And the, the, all the coins and all the gold, with the jewelry and the, the silver imitations were buried around 425, 430 AD. The hoard consists of several groups of coins that left the Roman Empire at different times, and the hoard found in Felp in 1750 was probably no different. The coins and jewelry of the Dortmund and Felp hoards were probably passed down through the generations with new valuables being added to the ensemble on a regular basis. Now there remains one last question to be answered. Why was all this gold buried in Felp in the 5th century AD? Again, there's no hard evidence and we can only speculate as to why the valuables were buried. In the past, burying treasure was often associated with the turmoil caused by invasions and wars and the need to secure valuables. It is striking that the two hordes from Felp and other hordes in Frankish territory, 10 in total, were buried at a time when relatively many hordes were buried across much of Europe. And these hordes are often interpreted as having been hidden in times of war and insecurity. So this is a perfectly valid theory, of course, and the burials could have been made in haste as a result of some kind of upheaval and the need to secure valuables. There are many uh, historical ev uh, uh, events that we do not know of because of the lack of historical sources. But there might be other possible interpretations. As there is no mention of other finds and no skeleton or ashes, we can probably rule out a burial in, the, uh, in a grave. There are two other possibilities, burial for safekeeping and burial as an offering in a sacred place as a gift to the gods are two other valid options. In the latter case, the gold would have been offered by the local elite to the gods and ancestors to ask to, for support or to thank them for favors granted. At the same time, the offering would have increased the prestige of those who made it. In this hectic period, in the first half of the 5th century, when the Roman Empire was on the verge of collapse, there must have been plenty of reason to ask the gods or ancestors for help. The same is true if the god was buried to hide it for safekeeping. Whatever the reason for burying the gold, the many cold hordes from the first half of the 5th century reflect the unstable political situation and many armed conflicts and the competition between elites and tribes in the lower Rhine area during this period. Finally, we return to the medallions found in 1715. Gold coins and medallions were used by the Roman emperors as a tool of power to manipulate Germanic and other tribes. Gold could be used to buy peace and support from their Frankish neighbors, making a powerful weapon that could be used to the benefit of Roman foreign policy. The emperor's portrait on the medallions was not only a sign of his supreme power, but also a kind of protective conductor. Hence, the eyelets on the medallions. The emperor's portrait could be worn and serve as a talisman to ward off kinds 
all kind, to ward off all kinds of evil. It is noticeable that the eyelets uh, on all the known medallions in the horde are mounted so that they are above the heads of the emperors on the obverse. The portrait side of the medallion was obviously considered the most important side, and the medallions were intended to be worn facing forward. The obverse of the medallions was also deliberately made much more beautiful than the reverse. Empresses, courtiers, and monarchs, dependent on the emperor, often wore, wore portraits of the reigning emperor as an amulet, but also as a sign of loyalty. Mummy portraits from Egypt show how cold medallions were used in the Roman Empire in the first half of the third century AD, a little earlier then. That just gives you an idea. So wealth and therefore power could be displayed by wearing medallions and other jewelry, and medallions with portraits of emperors and empresses could also serve as protective amulets and to show loyalty. I'm venturing a bit into unfamiliar territory for me here, but I think the cold medallions may also have had a similar function to the American peace medals given to Native American tribal leaders. The peace medals were also greatly valued, worn around the neck as a status symbol, and were buried with their owner or passed down from generation to generation. The medallions with the imperial Roman portraits may have been seen by the Germanic leaders and their followers as symbols of access to the Roman world, just like the peace medals that were also understood as a symbol of access into the world of the white man. The Roman cult medallions and the American peace medals were physical representations of a spiritual dimension that connected the medal wearer to a source of power, like the Roman Emperor Honorius and President Washington. When precious gold coins and medallions were given as, dipl as diplomatic gifts by the Romans, the imperial portraits were also a sign of the sovereignty of the giver over the recipient and a guarantee of the authenticity of any message or document accompanying the gift. In Frankish society, the Roman cult would have been used by chieftains and kings to consolidate or increase their power, and the medallions could also be worn if desired as a sign of allegiance to Rome, while leaders could wear them to distinguish, them, uh, to distinguish themselves from the rest of society. After their discovery in the 18th century, the medallions ended up in the collections of the local Dutch elite in Veld and Arnhem, such as the Baron von Spaan and several mayors of Arnhem. There, they owned collections of Roman antiquities, which also include, functioned, as, uh, functioned as status symbols, showing that they were educated and culturally literate. The medallions are now part of the collections of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and the Dutch National Numismatic Collection in Amsterdam, reflecting the richness of these collections. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll open up uh, to the floor for questions. So feel free to unmute yourself, ask any questions, or uh, you can also type into the chat if you prefer. While we're waiting for questions, uh, oh, wait, Mark, Mike's got one. Uh, why don't you go ahead, Mike? Yes. Uh, Roman gold medallions were made in multiples of uh, solidus. It looks like the smaller uh, medallion in your collection might be a three or four solidus piece. The mm -hmm. Honorius looks like it might be six solidi. Uh, it is estimated, uh, considering the the weight of um, the estimated weight of the uh, the, the uh, decorated edge, that the Gala Placidia medallions, the smaller ones, are one and a half solidus only, and the Honorius uh, medallions four and a half solidi. That's how they are also listed in the RIC. I think. Thank you. Yes. Welcome. Any other questions or comments for Paul?
One question I had was you had suggested, um, you know, perhaps one of the reasons for the Horde's deposition was um, religious uh, as a votive offering or, or something along those lines. Um, oftentimes in such kinds of um, depositions, you see destruction of objects or ritual destruction. It looked like everything you showed was pretty, pretty well preserved. Did, are there any kind of mutilated objects or broken objects in the hoard at all that you know of? No, no, no. Um, all the hoards, in fact, um, I know of um, from the Frankish area with the Felp type jewelry um, has all intact uh, torques and neck rings of the Felp okay. type. All the medallions are uh, well, well, pristine. Let's mm -hmm. say there's nothing happened to them and they're not consciously destroyed. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And of course, we are lacking uh, the context. Yeah. And normally, uh, you um, might look for a wet context or uh, something like a riverbed or something like that, a crossing. There's, yeah, obviously, if the 1715 Horde is, uh, well, all of those context information is not. Uh, not, not available and for all the other 19th century hordes, most of them were found uh, fairly early on. There's no context uh, whatsoever. Right. So it's, uh, well, it, it's, it's speculation at best, yeah. Of course, yeah. And then I guess it could also be different cultural practices. You know, it doesn't have to be destroyed to be uh, or mutilated or broken or anything to be a, a ritual offering necessarily. Yeah. Um, we've got a question in the chat uh, from Mary Lannan. Were there many gold hoards besides the 1907 hoard that contained silver coins? Any silver only hoards from the same period? No, the Dortmund hoard is, uh, I think, uh, as far as I know, is an exception. And the rest is uh, all, uh, all gold. Um, the... Dortmund uh, silver coins are also very special. They are, I think, quite unique uh, um, local imitations of uh, Roman siliquai, which are already moving towards uh, early medieval um, style. And, and the, the, the closing date of the hoard, uh, the, the burial date, is estimated on the basis of, uh, of, of those silver, uh, uh, silver imitations of the Roman coins, and so the, the Germanic coins. Um, but they are the, the latest element of, uh, of, of that, that hoard. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've got another question in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Who made the decorative borders, the Franks or the Romans? Ah, uh, that's a good one. Um, maybe, I don't know if I have still have that. No, I picked that out. Uh, I don't know if I have to, well, in 2009, uh, there was, well, I stopped sharing. At Christie's, at the auction, there was a cameo uh, which was described as uh, portraying um, Constantine the Great, which was in an exactly the same kind of border um, as the medallions uh, from the Felport, except that it was only one ring instead of the three uh, rings around it. Um, so, and it's just a spinning image, and I think it must have been from the same workshop. And I think uh, the whole thing was put together in an imperial workshop, um, like uh, Ravenna at in, in, in the neighborhood of the court. There was gold there, and there was uh, there were people there uh, uh, skilled at working at making uh, precious objects for the emperor. I think this is uh, a Roman work indeed. Yes. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. What was the value ratio of gold to silver at the time? Uh, that is a difficult question. Um, but I think normally 
uh, in uh, times when there is no abundance or shortage of uh, either one of the, those metals. Uh, I think we mostly reckon with a ratio of 1 to 12. I think that's kind of average for antiquity. Do you know more about it, Nathan? I don't. No. Not that period, no. Yeah. So that is all I have to offer on the ratio. Okay. Uh, another um, question. Did you mention that some hordes might have represented uh, collections? Can you say more about what? Uh, collecting meant at that time yeah i think it's you must consider that as collecting wealth and collecting prestige with that and collecting valuables and not per se collecting for the sake of collecting like uh, collectors like us do today uh, trying to catch um, maybe all the coins of one different emperor of as much as different emperors as, as possible um, what I was planning to say is that um, those hordes um, were the result of uh, accumulation of wealth by different persons from different generations. And uh, it started maybe, let's say, in the 350s uh, with a, a small sum of solidity uh, and one Germanic tribal leader got from uh, the Roman authorities. He gave it to his son or one of his son or more of his sons. And they caught perhaps uh, in uh, return for, uh, uh, for, for protection offered to the Romans or uh, 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 providing soldiers for the Roman, uh, uh, or could assist the Roman army, uh, maybe more called, and th that was added to that. And it's, I think it's, um, you can say safely that it is uh, collected over well, quite a long period of time because from the 360s onwards, the, the turnover of the Roman coins within the Roman Empire was quite, uh, quite uh, fast. And the whole thing, uh, uh, the whole Roman uh, financial administration was geared towards recycling um, solidly as fast as possible with as, as less uh, wear and tear uh, of the coins to get them uh, back <clears throat> as quickly as possible to the to the treasury um, and um, back uh, and uh, that was when people uh, paid their taxes taxes had to pay had to be paid in gold and before the uh, authorities accepted it and uh, the gold coins had to be melted and um, the purity had to be tested so the gold coins were of almost pure gold. And so you got almost pure gold, gold bars, which uh, went into the treasury as the payment of, uh, well, the normal taxes that all the Roman uh, citizens were obliged to pay. Uh, so what you have, uh, if you want to um, accumulate gold within the Roman Empire, and maybe uh, only savings hoard can span uh, a longer period of time, but the older coins will probably um, not be in it because they were of a lower uh, gold content um, with the um, with the um, how do you say that in English? Um, there were uh, reorganizations of the the monetary system in the three sixties. And then uh, the, uh, from that time onwards, the uh, finest of the gold coins was uh, consistently of a very, very, very high standard, so 99% plus uh, finest uh, percentage of, of gold in the, in, in the gold coins. I hope that answers the questions a little bit, or maybe I'm just blabbing about <laughs> too much. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, those were some really wonderful objects to see. Uh, you know, it's not every day we get the the gold medallions. Uh, so.